I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Growing Up Jewish Art and Storytelling with Jacqueline Cotwall. Uh, I do want to acknowledge before we begin today's program, uh, the uh, chaos and violence happening in Israel. I know it's, it may be on many of your minds in the audience. We will not be focusing on that during today's program, but I, I, I wanted to name it before we begin. Um, we're really delighted to have Jacqueline or Jackie with us today. Uh, we first became aware of Jackie's work in 2019 and felt it was a, a beautiful response to and reflection of so many of the themes that we deal with historically in the museum and, and Jackie deals with them artistically. So we're honored to host her this evening and to, to uh, share some of her work with you. Jackie is an artist and daughter of Holocaust survivors originally from Toronto. In 2005, she moved to Chicago, where she fulfilled a longtime goal of developing her painting skills by studying at the Art Center of Highland Park. Using a fresh palette of color, Jackie currently paints in oils and focuses on capturing precious moments with her family and friends. Her most recent project, entitled Growing Up Jewish Art and Storytelling, is a series of 35 contemporary oil paintings and personal narratives, exploring her North American brand of Jewish identity and how it evolved through five generations of her family. Her work has been exhibited in both group and solo exhibitions, and that his, her works are in private collections throughout the US, Canada, and Israel. So Jackie will present some of her uh, work from the Growing Up Jewish series this evening, and then there'll be time for Q&A afterwards. So please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end. Jackie, without further ado, welcome. Thanks for being here. Ari, thank you. And I'd like to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage for all the work you are doing to keep Holocaust memory alive and for the incredible honor of inviting me to speak here tonight. I also want to give a special shout out to my dear friend Meg Callahan and her niece uh, Joanna Klieger for connecting me to the museum. So I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me. Um, and we are going to get going. Okay, here we go. So what I'm going to show you today is a deeply personal series of paintings and stories I created to simply look at who and what shaped my North American brand of Jewish identity. This series is called Growing Up Jewish Art and Storytelling. I created it because I wanted to tell my family's North American Jewish story and perhaps shine a fresh new light on what Judaic art could look like. I'm going to start my presentation today by telling you a little bit about me and how I became inspired to create this series and how I ultimately found myself very unexpectedly and unintentionally in the role of uncovering, honoring, and sharing my family's Holocaust story through really all 35 of these paintings and stories that are based on five generations worth of vintage family photos. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about me. First, let's talk about my life as an artist. It was obvious from an early age. In fact, every single report card I received from Owen Public School in Toronto, where I grew up, said the same thing year after year. Jackie talks too much and she's good at art. As for my Jewish upbringing, I'll tell you this. In our comfortable Jewish-ish Toronto neighborhood, we were considered the big Jews. My parents survived the Holocaust as children and spoke Yiddish when they didn't want us to understand something. They were the founding members of our conservative movement synagogue, which we attended every week. We kept Shabbat, we kept kosher, and we observed all the holidays. I liked it, mostly. I remember when I was in middle school, I was so embarrassed to be the only family with a sukkah in our backyard on display for everyone to see. We lived in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, but nobody built them. I thought it was way too Jewish and I just wanted to be normal Jewish. It only recently occurred to me that the Jewish life we observed was inform informed in large part by the traditional brand of Judaism my parents brought with them from the old country after they immigrated in 1949. We were one of the only greener families in our neighborhood, which was largely populated by Canadian Jews people whose families had been, who had been in Canada for generations already. I'll be exploring this idea a little bit more later on in the presentation. Today, not much has changed about me. I still talk a lot. I paint almost every day, and now in our comfortable Jewish-ish suburb of Highland Park, Illinois, we are considered the big Jews, at least by some anyway, which is funny to me, it's full circle. 
So given my connection and involvement in my Jewish community, I've often been asked, Jackie, why don't you paint Jewish art? It was a good and logical question, but I had no idea what I'd even paint. I paint figures in bathing suits. I like to draw inspiration from vintage family photos taken in summer by pools and at the beach and then turn them into paintings. Judaism and art were two places where I felt very connected, but these were separate loves. Frankly, I resisted the thought of creating, creating Judaic themed art. And this is mostly because I had some very strong associations about what I thought Jewish art should look like based on the Jewish themed paintings that hung on the walls of my family home like this guy. <laughs> this man, this Hasidic rabbi presided over many episodes of the love boat and fantasy island in the TV room of my childhood home. To me, Jewish art fell into one of two categories. There were either limestone-hued scenes from Jerusalem or stern-faced bearded rabbis of old, and there was no real connection here for me. To begin with, my conservative movement rabbi had no beard and he wore turtlenecks. I had never seen a painting of Jewish summer camp, but that was where most of my important formative Jewish experiences occurred. There was a strong disconnect for me between the Judaism I saw framed in paintings on the walls and my lived experiences on the ground. But the question vexed me. I wanted to challenge myself to figure out how I could create Judaic art in a way that truly felt authentic to the Judaism I grew up with. And then one day I was at my parents' house going through their old photos mining for something to paint, and I found a 1970s photo of my conservative movement rabbi, and then I found a lovely 1960s image of a Seder at my grandparents' house. I had a flash of inspiration. What if I paint these images? Two years later, I launched an exhibit entitled Growing Up Jewish Art and Storytelling. Based on five generations worth of vintage family photos, I was able to create 35 oil paintings and short narratives to tell my family's Jewish story. As I take you on this journey with me tonight, I very much want you to come away from this presentation seeing the fullness of Jewish life. Much like the famous verse from the Fiddler on the Roof song, Sunrise, Sunset, Jewish life is laden with happiness and tears. As such, you will see that many of the paintings in the Growing Up Jewish series are playful recollections of the Judaism of my youth. A great many of these paintings, however, will address my family's experiences during the Holocaust and its aftermath, and how these stories shaped my Jewish decisions, both consciously and unconsciously. As I created this series, I spent a lot of time reflecting on what it meant for me to grow up in the shadow of the Holocaust as a member of the second generation. In all, I hope to give you a snapshot of North American Jewish life through five generations of one family that was devastated by the events of the Holocaust, that started over in Canada and rebuilt themselves and found their place in North America's vibrant Jewish communities. So I wanna give you some context. As I mentioned, I am a member of the second generation, a 2G. Both of my parents and their siblings, my grandparents and a fair amount of my extended family lived through the horror of the Holocaust. My father hid in a forest with his family for 19 months. It was a terrible ordeal during which time my great grandmother froze to death. It's a tiny detail, but my dad recounted in his memoir that she was wearing a red and white polka dotted dress. My mother's family was in the Krakow ghetto narrowly escaping certain death and Nazi firing squads by using false passports to survive. My mother's extended family was interned at Auschwitz and some of them were saved by Oskar Schindler. All of my great grandparents perished at the hands of the Nazis. For me, the generation that survived the Holocaust existed in living color in their printed sundresses, socks and sandals with numbers tattooed on their arms. I grew up amongst people who were broken and haunted by their past but who still managed to summon great love for my generation and indescribable gratitude for Canada where they emigrated and the triumph that my sisters, cousins, and I represented. These people were characters with huge personalities. Some were gentle and optimistic, some were hilarious, some were strong-willed while others appeared to always live at the edge of anger or close to tears. All of them were permanently scarred to varying degrees by living in towns and cities where their neighbors and government turned their backs on them 
betrayed them, persecuted and murdered their parents, friends and community, all for the crime of being born Jewish. Let me take you into a slideshow. One second, there we go. Let's get this thing going here, one second, okay. When I created this series, my interest was to look at Jewish identity as it evolved in North America. Truth be told, I deliberately tried to avoid the Holocaust when I started making these paintings. I wanted this series to be completely relatable, no matter where you came from in the arc of the North American Jewish story. But every time I worked on a new image, whether it was my sister Caroline singing the four questions at Passover, or my parents' first trip to Israel, or my daughter's bat mitzvah celebration, my mind kept drifting back to the miracle of it all. None of us should be here. Hitler and the Nazis wanted my family and all of our future generations to be gone from the face of the earth. My Auntie Sylvia always used to say, we are survivors. I never understood why she included me in that statement until now. As I created this painting series, I realized that my art provided a powerful vehicle to honor the memory of my family members who were murdered and whose lives were never spoken of again and to tell the survival and rebuilding stories of my parents, grandparents, and extended family members. For example, nobody really knew or remembered Usher's story of how he survived a bicycle chain beating while protecting his brother. I only remembered him as the quiet, broken uncle who came alone to all of our birthday parties. As a member of the second generation, we are truly a unique subset of the Jewish community. We were used to living in homes where there were no old family photos. We straddled two worlds. We were equally comfortable in the homes of greeners where broken English was spoken in thick accents and expectations were high. Sometimes these homes felt really heavy and sad, especially if the survivors had whole lives before the war, including spouses and children who were taken from them. In Canada, these families were on round two starting over with replacement spouses and replacement children who felt the enormous burden of trying to make highly traumatized parents feel whole again. People who weren't necessarily compatible because of age differences, former social standing in the old country or religious observance levels, married out of practical necessity or pure loneliness. We understood that too. It wasn't all dark though. My parents were so in love with each other and they appreciated how much they had achieved in Canada. Our home felt pretty free and fun, but we were used to seeing numbers tattooed on the soft skin of the arms that hugged us. We were loved beyond measure and knew that in their eyes, we were considered precious walking miracles on earth. There's nothing quite like the victory look a survivor gazes at his or her grandchild. Likewise, we loved visiting the seemingly carefree modern homes of our friends whose parents were born in North America and did things that were inconceivable to us, like eating everything on the menu at Chinese restaurants or going on family ski trips. When we were growing up, ripped jeans were in style just like now. And I remember my Holocaust survivor relatives were nervous when we wore them. They worried that we had fallen on hard times again. As loved as we were, there were unspoken rules. Those of us who are 2Gs understood that our parents' generation had been through enough and our job was to make sure that we did not disappoint them. All they wanted from us was Yiddish nachas, pride and joy. Of course, Yiddish nachas meant different things in different households. It's some, in some homes, it simply meant that all we had to do was walk in the room. In others, it meant that we should play the violin, go to law school at least. Go to, school, go, to, go to shul, keep kosher, marry someone whose parents are greeners, and don't name your babies without talking to us first, and don't get divorced, and on and on and on. It was the least we could do. As I reflected on my family, I marveled at them. I knew their stories of survival. It was the years following the Holocaust that really got my attention. There were so many obstacles to overcome when they immigrated to Canada in 1949. How did these people arrive in North America with nothing, having endured the worst and then managed to keep going and make a new life? Who was able to pull it off and what motivated them? Who wasn't? What was the role of optimism in the rebuilding process? Was opportunity shared equally in these families? 
Who sacrificed so that others could advance and what resentments did those left behind harbor inside of them? For many relatives like my Zadie, the prime years of their lives happened during the Holocaust. By the time Zadie arrived in Canada, it was clear to him that real opportunity was reserved for younger generations and not himself. He had to accept the fact that his small schmata business was never going to amount to much. I also wondered, what was it like to reunite with family members who were safe in Canada during the war and who knew nothing of the suffering? Were these happy reunions or were they awkward? Survivor's guilt was rampant all around, not to mention the fact that families are complicated. I know that in mine, these reunions sparked the kind of anger that generated a lifetime of broigus, which is Yiddish for holding a grudge. It had something to do with my dad having to sweep the floors of our Canadian cousin's dress factory. Imagine the pride my survivor grandparents, who came from a village that looked like Anatevka, felt when my dad graduated from law school. Being snubbed by Canadian cousins really got under their skin. How did the existing Jewish community prepare to help these people whose material and emotional needs were so profound and overwhelming? From what I understood, the Canadian Jews were quite adept at providing for the material needs of the refugees, but socially and emotionally, there was a huge divide. Neither side wanted to talk about the horrors. This was not a generation that was used to talking about their feelings. The survivors created communities of their own sticking together at local parks on their days off from work in the garment factories, hoping to find Lanzmann and grateful to be in the company of people who wordlessly understood them. Every success was monumental. What could be better than passing the high school matriculation exams and then getting a degree and attending law school after virtually missing a lifetime of education during the war years and time spent in the DP camps? How victorious was it to host a Pesach Seder and hear the Canadian grandchildren read the four questions at a large family gathering? Think about the satisfaction of being able to volunteer and give financial donations back to the community that supported them and gave them outfits to wear from a clothing bank. Can you imagine these people earning enough money to give tzedakah and spend winters in modest apartments in Florida or go on a vacation in the Catskills? Imagine how powerful it was for these people to visit the modern state of Israel, a place that might have saved so many if it had existed only 10 years earlier in the 1930s. That must have been very difficult for that generation to reconcile. You probably noted in this slideshow that there are images of Jewish life as observed by my generation and my children's generation, albeit somewhat different from the Judaism of the old country. Remember what Auntie Sylvia said? We, the second and third generations, are survivors too. I thought it was important to note that despite everything, the Jewish people continue. Am Yisrael Chai. As I painted these paintings and wrote these stories, I truly felt the awesome responsibility to make sure that my family's Holocaust stories, the ones that were so close to being relegated to the dustbins of history, were uncovered, recorded, and told. I am so grateful to my dad for writing his memoir before he passed away, and my mom for recounting these Holocaust and Jewish stories for me. Okay, so let's get out of the slideshow. This one, back one. Okay, here we go. So what I'd like to do now is focus in on a few of the paintings from the collection and read their accompanying narratives to you. Here you will see the early integration experiences of my family and what it was like to find their place within the established Jewish community. In these next few paintings and stories, I wanted to explore the social divide that existed between the Canadian Jews and the newly arrived refugees. In this slide, you'll see a painting on the right by Fairfield Porter, who is an artist that I'm inspired by. And on the left is a painting I created entitled Greeners, Gaylers, and Fairfield Porter. It's based off of a photo that was taken in 1950. And here's the story. I am most enamored with the paintings of Fairfield Porter. He was a Kennedy era American artist who painted my fantasy of the good life. Genteel people of a certain lineage enjoying summer moments at his family's historic beach house in Maine. A wash in color, Porter captured images of generations reading together on the screened porch, Friends gathered in conversation on sun-washed Adirondack chairs, morning tennis matches in preppy whites. 
as much as I idealize this world, I know that my people did not come from that stock or live like that. My mother-in-law once explained to me the Jewish social hierarchy as she experienced it. There were greeners and galers. She was a greener. I came from greeners. Galer is Yiddish for yellow and greener, well, that's obvious. These terms are used as immigration and lineage metaphors. She explained that a galer is like a yellow vegetable that has had time to ripen on the vine, while a greener, like a green vegetable, is new on the vine. If you're a greener, it means you're an immigrant from the old country and you have an accent. A galer is someone whose ancestors have been, who have been living on, in the new world for generations. Galers have ripened on the vine of America for a long time. Stereotypically, galers have had time to build their fortunes in this country, become genteel, and take their place as part of the leisure class. They might sail or have beach homes. They play tennis. I love this image of my husband's grandparents. There they are, two greeners, as if planted into a Fairfield Porter painting, but just on the other side of the fence. It was a moment captured only a few short years after escaping the ravages of war. I love that they figured out how to insert themselves if not in, then beside the leisure class of the Gaylers. They cast off their heavy clothes and the baggage of the past and had their day in the sun. So this next painting explores the early reunions of families after the Holocaust. Here's how this story went down. Oi, this painting is called Usher Had High Hopes. And it's based off of a photo that was taken in 1970. Usher was my father's uncle. He never married or had children. In 1949, after surviving the Holocaust, Usher arrived in Canada with my grandfather, my dad, and my aunt Sylvia. The four of them were sponsored and taken in by their brother of Room, who had moved to Montreal in 1929. Of Room was fortunate. He was safe in Canada when the Nazis came to power, and he became financially well off by opening a dress factory. When the three siblings reunited, it was awkward to say the least. Two brothers suffered greatly during the Holocaust while the other was comfortable enough to buy a new Pontiac. Usher felt personally insulted when my dad, only 16 years old, was handed a broom on his first day in Canada and told to sweep the floors of the dress factory. Actually, Usher was livid and it marked the beginning of a lifetime of Bruges, which is Yiddish for holding a grudge with that side of the family. In my father's memoir, he describes that moment. Quote, this outburst of indignation at his brother was like an opening scene in a play by Tennessee Williams. Usher must have figured out that there was not gonna be manna falling from the sky and sweeping his brother's floors was the proverbial last straw that shattered his dream of how it would be. The next day, we moved into a nice second story flat on Jean Man Street at the Northwest corner of St. Theater. One can only imagine the pride Usher must have felt on the day my father graduated from law school. Usher died in 1972. He had terrible scars on his body from the time when the Ukrainian police at the direction of the Nazis beat him with a bicycle chain. This painting is really new. In fact, it's still drying. It's called Cheder in the DP camp, and it's based off of a photo that was taken in approximately 1948. I wanted to show this painting because at 15, this was my dad's first real experience with education. In his memoir, he explains that in all, he had two years of formal education in his youth. He had completed the equivalent of first grade before the war, during which time he and his family fled to the forest to hide for 19 months. When the war ended and they were in Russia, my dad had to work to help the family stay afloat. It was only when his family arrived in the DP camp in Poland that he finally had one year of education. My dad was 16 when he finished seventh grade in 1949. The war and post-war years in Europe had robbed him of his entire youth. He never had a bar mitzvah, nor did he receive an education. This painting is based off of a photo that I used to study as a child when I was growing up, I had some understanding of the Holocaust, but I couldn't figure out why all those kids looked so old. There's my father in the front row. He was so eager to learn. He told me that he loved that one year he had in school. Remember my report cards, the ones where my teacher said that I talked too much? I think he would tell me this to inspire me to take my studies more seriously. 
As I painted these faces of these 14 and 15 year olds, I couldn't help but compare them to my own child who was 14 today. These children struck me as so haunted and so profoundly exhausted. I wondered what they had witnessed and who they had lost, who looked after them. Did they rebuild? And how did life turn out for these children? When my dad graduated law school and was called to the bar in 1960, one of the senior lawyers at the firm where he articled remarked, it's a long way from the forests of Poland to the halls of Osgoode Hall Law School. So as I was mentioned in my father's memoir, he recounts the challenging path he got himself on shortly after he arrived in Montreal at the age of 16. He was so determined to go from being a refugee to being, as he described it, a somebody and get a degree. After almost an entire lifetime without a formal education, there were a few key players in the background who showed immeasurable kindness and sacrificed for him to reach his near impossible goals. Here are their stories. Let's start with the painting on the right. It's called Nobody Asked Auntie Sylvia and it's based off of a photo from about 1977. This is a newer painting and I wanted to show it because I always wondered if my dad's sister Sylvia resented the fact that after the Holocaust, her life was dictated by practicality and old fashioned sexism. I don't imagine Zadie and Usher were, were reading the early feminist writings of Betty Friedan in those days. Nobody asked Auntie Sylvia if she would enjoy or benefit from a higher education. When she moved to Canada as a teenager, Sylvia was relegated to the kitchen to cook and clean for the men of the house while the educational opportunities were heaped onto my father. It wasn't fair. I know that my father felt really guilty about this and we all had nothing but gratitude for Auntie, Auntie Sylvia's sacrifices to help my dad achieve his goals. Her role wasn't lost on me either. My sisters and I all benefited from Auntie Sylvia's efforts. Sylvia passed away recently in, in this past March at the age of 89. I hope I asked her all the questions I wanted to ask. So, now I'm gonna direct you to the painting on the left. Um, and I wanna emphasize that this image of my father's graduation from university was taken only eight short years after that year of Cheder in the DP camp. Here's the story that goes with this painting, which is called A Victory for Bernie, Sylvia, Zadie, Usher, and Meryl. And it's based off of a photo that was taken in 1956. Here's the story. When my family immigrated to Canada in 1949 after the Holocaust, there were so many obstacles to overcome. Every success was monumental. What could be better than passing the high school matriculation exams and then getting a degree and attending law school after vi virtually missing a lifetime of education during the war years and time spent in the DP camps? When my dad graduated from Sir George William University, now Concordia University, it wasn't just for him. There were so many people who were invested in this achievement especially those who hid in the forest with him for 19 months during the war. But the person who really deserves a special mention was a teacher named Miss Mitchell. Miss Mitchell. Shortly after my dad immigrated to Canada and was learning to speak English, he happened upon a tutor who was helping a boy who lived in his flat. Miss Mitchell wasn't wanting to take on any more students, but she saw something special in my dad and decided to help him get ready to take the grade 11 matriculation exams. Realizing that he was a refugee and funds were tight, she refused to take her full pay. Here is how my father honored Miss Mitchell in his memoir. Quote, in late summer 1953, I learned Miss Mitchell was not well and that she couldn't continue tutoring and guiding me anymore. I soon wrote some seven or eight exams and passed. I was admitted to Sir George William University and I personally wanted to tell Miss Mitchell. I found out that she was now at the Royal Victoria Hospital. When I came there, her brother told me that she was dying of cancer and that the diagnosis was the reason for her relatively early retirement. I was allowed to see her. She was alert and I told her the good news. I gave her my hand and she squeezed it hard. She died a week later. Amazing how she did not let on over all those months that she tutored me. The vehicle of this lady's generosity carried me through the roughest terrain on my journey to where I wanted to go." Unquote. Okay, so as I painted these paintings and interviewed my mom, I learned a lot about the two sides of the Jewish community. There was the world of the newly arrived refugees as seen in the painting on the left, and that of the Canadian Jews. 
These two paintings speak to that divide. And I'm now going to read the story that goes with the painting on the right, which is entitled 1950 Ladies Auxiliary Tea for the United Jewish Welfare Fund. Here's the story. When my parents immigrated to Montreal after the Holocaust, they, like so many survivors, were absorbed by the established Jewish community. I never really thought about the task of welcoming thousands of refugees, many if not most of whom arrived in Canada traumatized by the events of the Second World War. How did the established Jewish community prepare to help these people whose needs were so profound? I have nothing but gratitude for the types of women, like those pictured here, who came together to fundraise, collect material donations, volunteer at clothing banks, and provide scholarships to young refugees who couldn't afford tuition at, for Jewish summer camps and schools. I am certain that in the early 1950s, my family benefited from these efforts and generosity. In many ways, however, Montreal's Jewish community, like so many established Jewish communities in North America, was strained by the sudden influx of Jews from the old country. While united by a common code of religious practice and customs, these Jews couldn't have been more different from each other. It was nearly impossible for the survivors to talk about the horrors inflicted by the Nazis. And frankly, the established community was not all that interested in hearing about it, at least not back then. It was beyond overwhelming for both sides. Furthermore, the arrival of the refugees altered the landscape of the established Jewish community and thus brought a sense of insecurity for them. Would the very presence of these immigrants threaten the equilibrium and tentative acceptance the Canadian Jews had worked so hard to achieve? Living quietly in suburbs alongside the larger Gentile Canadian community? The Canadian Jews had their own story. They were the descendants of parents and grandparents who fled the pogroms in Russia. At the turn of the century, these people arrived on boats only to be greet greeted by a Canadian society that had restricted neighborhoods, hotels and beaches, quotas for higher education and outright disdain for the Jewish immigrants and their ways. It took 50 years for those Jews in Canada to respond to this brand of anti-Semitism and build their own parallel institutions like the Jewish General Hospital or social clubs or the YMHA or the various Jewish community centers. As these early Canadian Jews amassed wealth, many simply wanted to just fit in, to look and act like their Gentile neighbors and deflect any negative attention. The presence of the Holocaust survivors must have reminded them of their grandparents and the obstacles they overcame. The Canadian Jews definitely cared about the well-being of the Holocaust survivors and took responsibility to help them, but they didn't always want to socialize or live in the same neighborhoods as the refugees. Perhaps it was too painful, or it was snobbery, or maybe a little bit of both. Time is a funny thing though. Within a generation, the children and grandchildren of the refugees and those of the established Canadian Jews were almost immediately indistinguishable. I know this firsthand. Most of my friends descended from the established Canadian Jewish community. We freely and happily socialized in each other's homes. We went to the same summer camps, high schools and universities, attended the same parties, dated each other, got married and built lifelong friendships together. For better or for worse, this pattern repeated itself with the influx of the Russian Jews who arrived in Canada and the United States in the early 1990s. So I now want to share these two paintings and focus on my great-grandparents. You have Hialeah on the right and Godel Mangel on the left. They were not married to each other, rather they were Mahatunam, in-laws. These two people's stories were almost lost forever because nobody wanted to talk about them. I think I understand why. Immediately after they were murdered, Godel and Hialeah's surviving family members had to compartmentalize these horrors and go into survival mode in order to get through the war, save their children and each other. If they didn't, my grandparents would have completely fallen apart and then they all would have perished. But even in Canada, I believe my grandparents needed to stay partially in survival mode in order to keep moving forward with their lives. Telling their parents stories would cause them to relive the horror all over again. When my sisters and I were born, my parents thought it was too scary to share their fates with us. And they wanted to protect us so we didn't have nightmares. In the end, my great grandparents were treated as if they didn't exist. But I wanted to know who they were and what happened to them. My mom finally told me. So what I'm gonna do now is read the story that goes with the painting on the left. It's called A Dignified Background. And here's the story. 
The first time I learned about my great grandfather, Godel Mangel, was in middle school. We had to create a family tree and present an heirloom for a special class project. My family tree was sparse. It included all the names of my grandparents, but only a couple of names from my great grandparents' generation and nothing else. My parents were children during the Holocaust and they knew little, very little about our past. I asked about Godel, one of the few names on the exotic great grandparent line. My mother told me that he was taken by the Nazis and provided no other details. I then asked if we had any family heirlooms and the answer was no. Everything we had was acquired after the family immigrated to Canada in 1949. At that time, our stuff was around 30 years old. So nothing passed from generation to generation. For a history lover like me, I felt deflated. When it was time to present our trees and heirlooms at school, I worried that my teacher would think that I didn't put any effort into the assignment. I recall a boy in my class, Teddy, proudly wearing his great grandfather's First Nations headdress. His family had been on the land for thousands of years. I was jealous of Teddy. He had a proud history that he could trace. How ironic. As Teddy spoke, I saw how much the Holocaust had robbed my family. Our names and our records and our possessions were obliterated. Fast forward to today. Thousands of documents are being uploaded almost daily onto websites dedicated to preserving precious details about who existed when the Shoah started. I searched Godel Mangel. Imagine my surprise when a photo from a Krakow ghetto identity card uploaded onto my monitor. My handsome great-grandfather looking humiliated, resigned, terrified, brave, and dignified all in the same moment was staring at me. He was 66 years old. My mom recognized him immediately, even though she was five years old the last time she saw him alive. She finally shared what happened to Godel. His was one of our family's unspeakable stories. Grandfather Godel was taken to one of the camps and was the victim of the Shoah's most sinister of crimes. I heard my mother's words like sound bites. They used him for science experiments and they injected him with gasoline. It's no wonder she didn't share details with me about him when I was in middle school. I can barely put words to it now. I suddenly realized that he is no grave and that his story was so close to being relegated to the dustbins of history. I could almost feel his soul lingering in the heavens with no peace. I decided to provide great grandfather Godel with a small monument to honor his life. As best I could, I created this painting out of a photo that was taken in an act of hatred. My studio took on a sacred quality. I was able to reach across time and space and recreate an image of my great grandfather's face, but this time with love. Every breaststroke felt important. A powerful moment happened when the music on my iPhone looped to the Leonard Cohen song, You Want It Darker. Just as I felt I had captured Godel's likeness, I heard the haunting words of the chorus singing, he nay me, he nay me, which means here I am my eyes filled with tears. The background pattern is from my dining room wallpaper, the room where Godel's great, great grandchildren come together every week to celebrate Shabbat and continue living our Jewish heritage, the real heirloom that has been passed down from generation to generation. May you find abundant peace from heaven, dear great grandfather Godel. Okay, one last one. This painting is called the Simcha or a joyful occasion. And it was taken in 1974, this image. So as this presentation winds down, I wanna conclude by showing you a painting I started working on at the beginning of the pandemic. This was my quarantine project and it's lofty with 31 faces to paint in one image. I wanted to paint this one because this is the group that started in Krakow before the war, survived the Holocaust and then immigrated to Canada to build a new life. The photo was taken in the 1970s at my cousin Helen's wedding in Montreal, and it was the last time they would all have a photo taken together like that. My grandparents died shortly after that wedding. The people here are Chaya Lea and Godel Mangel's descendants. The woman seated in blue, my Aunt Scylla, is the little girl who was sitting on Chaya Lea's lap in the last painting. She and her siblings were saved by Oscar Schindler. The boy in the middle is my cousin Jerry, he was named for Godel Mangel. Every single person in this image was touched by the Holocaust. You have our American cousins from New York City who lived with tremendous guilt that they didn't bother to sponsor the family from Krakow. These New York cousins spent the rest of their lives feeling so burdened by Hialeah's murder and the suffering of the family. 
My mother told me that they were quite well to do and every time one of the survivor cousins got married or had a baby, the New York City cousins would send $5,000 gifts. That was, and frankly still is, a lot of money, especially in those days. You have my uncle Shia, who lost his parents and siblings and his entire extended family in the concentration camps. My mother told me that he was so protective over his children and that created a lot of pressure in their household. You have my dad and my aunt Sylvia who survived by hiding in a forest for 19 months. You have my cousins, Mary, Helen and Lorna who were born in DP camps in Italy following the war. And you have my older sisters in the front row, all of whom were named for great grandparents who were systematically and brutally murdered. The reason why I wanted to create this painting now, especially during COVID, was because it enabled me to remind myself that dark times do pass. I see all these people who live through the unthinkable, dressed in their pink and purple dresses, celebrating a good occasion at a simcha, and I remain optimistic that what we've been going through now with this pandemic will pass, and we will all come back together again for better days ahead. All right, so that concludes my presentation, Ari, I'm gonna stop the share and bring it back to you. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Jackie, your art is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box. Um, we'll, we'll take as many as we can now. Let me um, start with this question from Amy. She's asking what are the dimensions of your paintings? And I, I might build on that and ask if you could tell us a little bit about the physical painting process. You mentioned that a lot of them started with photographs. What else plays a role in your process? Oh, those are fantastic questions. Okay, so I have um, the paintings range, range in size. You can actually probably see the one behind me of my father's graduation. It's tiny. It's literally like the size of a piece of paper, like eight by 11. Um, and they range. The largest paintings that I make in this collection are 30 by 40. Um, and a comfortable size that you'll see often for me is 30 by 30 or 24 by 36. So they, they range, there's a whole bunch of them. And your next question, Ori, was about the process and what I'm thinking about. Okay, so there's, there's like a million, there's a million things going on. So um, one of the things that I love, uh, and maybe the photographers out there can answer this, but there's something about the way I like a camera photographs um, people. You sort of catch them when they're really natural. So I, I do really love the sort of naturalness of uh, photos taken by the Leica camera. And it happens that my father was a really gifted photographer, just catching things that I guess he felt were important to, to um, document for the family. But of course, we're so used to high resolution. Um, so I, I take black and white pictures or, or I take, you know, sort of dim color photos and I just brighten them up. And often what I'll do is I'll take patterns that are meaningful to me. So for example, in the, in the uh, Schmatza business store, you have everything going on here. There's, there's fabric from dresses that we wore from, as children. You have um, the wallpaper pattern from my childhood bedroom. I really tried to incorporate um, the red polka dots just to sort of acknowledge um, my great grandmother and, and her story to sort of have a thread that connects to her in the reference thread. But, um, and then I also punch it up with this green and white polka dot thing. And I, that's a slight nod to Alex Katz, who is a real favorite artist of mine and who uses that pattern in a lot of his work. Well, that's a good segue to a question from Ashton here. Um, besides Alex Katz, you just mentioned, are there other North American artists that inspired your work? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, so of course there's Alex Katz. I love Fairfield Porter, uh, David Hockney, um, certainly when I do my swimming pools. Um, there's uh, a slim errands too, also a little more in my swim, swimming pool direction. Uh, Jewish art was a little bit harder for me to connect to. I know there's some really incredible Jewish artists out there. Um, there's actually a local artist here. His name is Howard Schwartz and um, he totally has my number and he loves the idea of working with vintage family images as well, but he does them in collage form. So I would look him up too. Howard Schwartz in Chicago is an artist, fabulous. I totally, I totally see the David Hockney uh, in your in your work as well. And here's hoping that your work goes at auction to, uh, at the same price that his does. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, there's a question from Joanna about how your surviving family members feel about you sharing your family story through art in this sort of public way. 
Well, I guess you'll have to ask them, but so far they keep coming to my talks. So I'm assuming they're not, uh, they're into it. <laughs> and there are a lot of them are on this call tonight, so I'm thrilled. Um, you know, I think what I'm hearing, mostly I think from the next generation, my, my children, my sister's children is gratitude because these stories were gonna disappear. And were it not for my sort of, you know, I had this really, um, thank God, amazing relationship with my mom. I call her every day, we chit chat, and it's been a really good project for the two of us to, you know, ask questions. And then what it's done is it's forced my mother, not forced, I mean, she's wanted to do it. She'll, she'll call her cousins and corroborate some of her memories. And so for example, my mom told me that she got together with her cousin, Mary, and she asked her, you know, just a really simple question. How did your parents get onto Schindler's List? You know, like that's just a straight, you know, it's a good question. And Mary said, well, as it turns out, her mother's best friend was dating Oscar Schindler. And he said, who would you like on the list? So uh, he lists, she listed everybody she knew, including my entire family. So it was just, that was such a little tiny corner of history that I don't think you would see in the movies or anything. That's just stuff that you find out from talking and asking questions. How's your mom doing? Is she still in Toronto? My mother is still in Toronto and she's incredible. She's an artist. She's incredibly gifted. Um, so I'm so grateful. I have some of, you know, some of her genetic material and she's also given me a real strong love of color. So in stark contrast to the heavy rabbi paintings that hung in my house, we had a lot of beautiful work that she created over the years. Barb is asking if you could dive into your use of color a little bit more. And you mentioned that phrase, which I love that you remember the survivors in living color. Uh, is your use of color a, a way of contrasting with the somber subject matter or is it not that um, direct? It depends. I mean, for that one that I just completed right now, The Hater, I was very disciplined because um, I like I like lots of color. It's funny because I only wear like black and beige, but when I paint, I love color. Um, and so for The Hater one, I felt that that seemed still really sad as a sad moment in history. And I wanted to convey that by just sort of sticking to a very monochromatic palette of blues. But to me, it's these people were, they were characters. They were joyful people to be around. They were fun. I, I didn't, you know, you have to understand that from my perspective, I didn't grow up thinking that the Holocaust happened in black and white movies. It, it was it was these people who were so nice. And, you know, like I said, we were like miracles to them. So I remember them with such fondness. And I guess maybe that's why there's so much color there. And it's also like a way to paint like me. I, I, I love, you know, color rich paintings. And I wanted to figure out, well, how can I do this with, you know, my way? So yeah, I, I, I painted them as I remember them. It's kind of amazing. I mean, I think you know, at the at the museum, we had this collection of, of more than thirty thousand photographs and, and artifacts. And you walk around, and I mean, there's a lot of visual material, but it's like all in black and white, or or a sort of sepia tone. So there's, uh, I was really struck by the fact that you're telling stories in a new way by using color. Uh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Can you talk about? Uh, so your your experience is very Canadian growing up. Um, you're you're now American, or you live in Chicago. Do you get the sense that? Um, Canadian survivors and 2Gs had different experiences in any way from American survivors and 2Gs? And if so, how? I am a rare bird in my community. I, I know very few 2Gs. Um, but when I do, I have one friend who's a 2G and we kind of love, we love sort of connecting because we really understand the humor and um, just the nuances of what it was like to grow up with that generation and their sense of humor, the dry sense of humor, the way they spoke. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities. I actually think from the, the thing that I found amazing about this entire project is we're all kind of the same. Like that's, and it's very, it's, it's like a really um, reassuring type of feeling for me because I've done this presentation in um, the Quad Cities and, and truth be told, I'm not American, so I don't have to know this, but I had to look it up on a map, like where are the Quad Cities? And, they completely related to these stories. So I actually think um, Jewish communities have some nuanced differences, but we're all really alike. Well, I think per probably particularly in Canada and the US, but you have a unique lens having experienced both places. Mm -hmm. um, there are some questions about the future of the project. So you started 
creating this collection and it's 35 paintings, but I think you showed us more than 35 over the course of the presentation. Are there, or do you have multiple collections that are incorporated there? And, and uh, is it sort of limitless into the future? <laughs> well, it was a long pandemic. I had to keep myself busy. <laughs> so, um, and, and once, you know, I think inspiration is an amazing thing because once it starts, it's like a font that keeps going and you believe it will never end. But so far I'm in this stage of like, there's so many different angles to tell the story and uh, different paintings to make. And so I'm constantly dreaming them up. So I think when I started presenting this to you, yeah, there were maybe 30 when I started with you, then we became 35 and I think I'm, I'm into 40 paintings. Um, so it, it does keep going. Um, and as for the future of this present, this uh, event, so it's a good question. First of all, you know, I, I very naively thought, well, I'm just going to do a traveling exhibit, but there's nothing quite like launching a traveling exhibit during a pandemic. Um, but like with most of us, you know, we all had to, and may we never use this word again, pivot and figure out another approach to things. And I discovered the power of Zoom artist talks. And I was able to actually stand here like with a megaphone reaching audiences everywhere. In fact, I'm doing a talk on Thursday for the South African Holocaust and Genocide Center, which is incredible. So what I'm hoping is, is that this is sort of like a precursor um, to what will become hopefully a traveling exhibit once we've put this pandemic behind us and our galleries and museums are running at full speed. So I'll be working on that in the next few months. I'd love to be able to walk into a museum, ours or another museum, and see your, see your work on the walls. Well, I'll just say the word. <laughs> Miller is asking about your own kids, um, how you talk about your family story with them and in what ways do you think their experiences as uh, uh, three G's are different from yours as a two G? Amazing questions. Um, okay, so first of all, I think part of what informed a lot of my Jewish decisions probably had something to do with coming, you know, coming into this world as a sec second generation. So um, my, we are the big Jews in our community. We're like the rare people who choose Jewish day school over these incredible public schools that are right around the corner from our home and our suburb. Um, but I, I do not regret that decision for one second. I think it was an incredible partner in what I think is an uphill battle in terms of raising um, kids who feel connected and love being Jewish. Um, so, so my kids had a lot of Holocaust education in at Solomon Schechter Day School and Rochelle Zell Jewish High School where they attended school. Um, and I think for them, it was, I wouldn't call it a point of pride, but it was certainly a point of connection that when they did those Holocaust um, se um, sessions in school, they could connect it to themselves personally. Um, it's interesting, the, the behavior that we transmit from one generation to the next. Um, my daughter, who's 14, uh, came home one day and she was watching a video of a woman um, who was a Holocaust survivor who was discussing um, the experience of forgiving Mengele for doing experiments on her and her twin sister. And my daughter was watching this and she was so upset by this. And I had only just learned about my great grandfather and I literally couldn't tell her that this was in our family. So. For all I know, she's learning about it right now watching this, but, and I apologize in advance to my daughter for that, but um, I think it's important. And the other thing that's interesting too is, you know, my son, um, he keeps Godel Mangel's painting, like the, the photo of it, um, close to his desk at school. Um, so that, you know, this past year with the pandemic, it was emotional, it was difficult, it was stressful. And he said, sometimes you just look at it and, and gain strength from that and just go, I can do this too. So. Wow. And I'm, I'm sure you're talking about Eva Kaur, who founded the Holocaust Museum in Indiana, the Candles yes. Museum Center. And she just passed away last year. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned it, uh, as part of your sort of origin story as an artist that there was Jewish art on your walls growing up, but it wasn't representative of your Jewish experience. You have helped diversify the canon of Jewish art by producing all this, these rich paintings. Are, do you feel that now there are a lot more artists that are covering th that part of the Jewish experience or are we still in the same situation we were when you started? I'm seeing bits and pieces of it. Um, it's coming. I think people are trying to find that voice, not unlike me, uh, you know, it's, 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 and I'm finding people on Instagram, which is amazing. It has its uses. 
um, with people who are trying to do like a more contemporary approach to the paintings and, um, that we're used to seeing, contemporary images of rabbis and find their own expression of it. So I actually think Jewish art is probably, like this type of contemporary Jewish art is, is a growing field. Um, and there's lots to develop here. And so maybe that's why, you know, when I spoke to you, I had 35 paintings and now I'm probably at 45. Because <laughs> it's, it's rich. There's a lot there. Um, uh, there's so many questions here. I'm sorry we're not going to get to all of them. All right, Leslie's asking, this feels important. Which camp did you go to? She went to a Camp Winnebago. <laughs> oh, Winnebago and cream cheese. <laughs> That's why I remember the DJ at our middle school said that. Um, <laughs> Ramah, I went to Camp Ramah. Oh, awesome. I'll, I'll plug for everyone. We're actually developing a very exciting program right now at the museum for this July about the history of American Jewish summer camping, which is uh, a fascinating story. More. Jews per capita send more kids to summer camps than any other ethnic group in, in North America. So um, you are part of that story and hopefully we can tell it <laughs> a little bit in July. Um, Jackie, we need to wrap up in a minute. Uh, I, I wanna ask you what you'd like to leave us with in terms of a, a message or something to remember. Well, given, um, given what today feels like and you know, both today, like May 11th with what's going on in Israel and given what this past year has felt like, and I want to take you back to um, the line from Sunrise Sunset, um, Jewish life is laden with happiness and tears. I, I just wish everybody more happiness and fewer tears. That's what I'll leave it with. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, our audience should know that you have a book of uh, your Growing Up Jewish series. Um, so we put the link to that in the chat as well as your website, which is a great way to explore some of your work. Uh, it has been such a, a joy and an honor to, to have a window into what you do this evening. So thank you. Uh, I should also mention that everything we do at the Museum of Jewish Heritage is made possible through donor support. So to those of you listening this evening who are members or donors of the museum, thank you. It makes a great difference. And to those of you who aren't, uh, we'd appreciate if you would consider making a contribution in support of our work. The link to that is in the chat as well. Uh, our next public program is this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be exploring uh, American political leaders and their responses to the Holocaust with an interesting panel of experts. Um, so you can check out uh, register for that program and check out our other programs uh, on our website. We wish everyone safety and health and a great evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you Ari. Bye Jackie.